So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Todd Summers. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS and the Global Health Policy Center. Uh, this is a Friday afternoon before the 4th of July week conversation with uh, my friend and colleague Peter Small from the Gates Foundation. Uh, I spent uh, a few years working at Gates and Peter was one of my colleagues and allies in that institution. And when I heard he was coming back through DC, I think he arrived on a red eye and he's leaving on a red eye, so things have not changed too much. Uh, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to check in with him and find out how things are going broadly with TB, R&D, uh, and also more specifically what he picked up during his time in India. So this is intended to be a, a conversation. Um, just a little bit on format. Uh, I've got a few questions in my pocket I'm going to use to start things off, but I'm really hoping that this will be interactive with you. Uh, so we'll have a couple people with microphones who will be available in a few minutes uh, for you to ask questions. We do webcast these, so it's always helpful if you use the microphone so that people who are participating electronically uh, can hear what's going on. And so Peter's mother can get a full recording of how he does today. Most um, importantly. Most importantly. So Peter, thank you and, and welcome to CSIS. Um, Peter has been active in, in TB uh, professionally. Uh, he's been very much involved in shaping the Gates Foundation's approach to TB. In the last two years, he's been uh, in India. Uh, and he's returning to Seattle this fall. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to hear from him what's new, what's happening in the TB research and development uh, platform. Uh, what's exciting, what's coming at us that we ought to be gearing up for, all those kinds of things. So let me kick off a little bit and just ask you if you can give us your sense of, uh, of where you see the TB R&D uh, system going right now. What's, what's coming at us that's got, us most ex got you most excited? Uh, are we going to have a vaccine next week? Do we have a new diagnostic? Have we got new treatments coming? Uh, you know, when I was reading some of the preparatory material, uh, for this meeting, uh, I realized that the last vaccine we had was before my father was born, and he's 83. Uh, and the last TB drug we had was last year, but before that was when I was 13, and I'm over 50. Uh, so it, it feels like we're fighting this 21st century illness with a 19th century response. And, and I want to know what, what is it that's coming that's going to change that paradigm? Yeah, well, first of all, I thank all of you for coming, and I hope the lunch justifies it. Uh, <laughs> I would say the first thing that uh, is changed is the fact that we're talking about it. Uh, you know, you would not get this group together uh, as recently as five or ten years ago. And, uh, you know, the, what, what, we, what we saw in TB R&D was uh, a complete inaction for decades. You know, there were probably 40 years in which there was very little arguably no progress because there was no effort. And I think what we've seen in the last decade is an acceleration that the very significant investments from the NIH and from pharmaceutical companies and, and from the Gates Foundation has, has created this sea change. And, and it's really changed what was a vicious cycle uh, of, of neglect and despondency into one in which we're starting to see exciting new products. Some of those products are hitting the market, which are generating demand. And, and, and it's really been this, this, at the highest level, a flip from a, from a vicious to a virtuous cycle. The specific parts of that, I would say, are um, not surprisingly um, that diagnostics leading the way. You know, we have now, for the first time, the capacity for untrained healthcare workers to definitively diagnose TB uh, within two hours um, and know if it's drug resistant. And, 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 and we're starting to see now, you have been more than two and a half million of those tests uh, run in the world. And, 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 and there's tremendous uh, receptivity amongst the consumers. In the drug space, uh, you know, there've been two new licensed drugs. Uh, they've been shown to be effective. Uh, there's still some questions about safety, um, but, but they are actually just the front edge of, of, a, of a pipeline which I think is including other agents and, and importantly a whole new way of thinking about drug development which is to bring drug compounds together early. We know we're going to need multiple drugs to treat this. So rather than taking 15 years to figure out which drugs work and another 15 year, years to put them together, the whole process has been collapsed and, and, and including very significant involvement from regulators. 
so I'm, I'm super excited about the, uh, the drug space as well. And I, I think that, that that concept that you could promptly diagnose and treat TB is, is, is a really promising one. I think the holy grail remains a vaccine, and, and, and it's, it's unlikely in my mind, having actually now you know, lived and breathed in the, uh, in the epicenter of the, uh, of the uh, epidemic, that, that, that we do need a vaccine to finish the job. And, and uh, you know, the, the great thing is that we've completed a phase three trial. We've shown uh, that we can get definitive answers, and, and, and unfortunately, that trial was ineffective. But I, I think that the, the, the vaccine pipeline uh, is now something which we can, we know we can test. And do you think that there are more products coming down the line in terms of vaccines that are going to uh, complement the one that, that showed no efficacy? I mean, where, if we do need a vaccine to bring TB uh, to an end, how long do you think that we're going to have to wait? Yeah, you know, so, so the, the bet that was made 10 years ago was that we had enough candidates so that if we pushed them into human trials, we would get either a vaccine or a signal about what the immune response is that a vaccine is working. Uh, the, the pretty resounding negative results of that, uh, that test, that, that, tr that trial, has reiterated the importance of fundamental understanding. So I think what it's, what it's doing is it's sending many people further upstream to try and, try and take a more fundamental science approach uh, to understanding that. And, and you know, the good news is in the last 10, 15 years, there's been massive in, in, in improvements in, in understanding immunology. This whole systems immunology uh, is, I think, one that we're all very excited about. So while we're waiting for a vaccine, we're dealing with treatments, and clearly one of the challenges we've seen is, uh, is that treatments are long-term. Uh, they require patients to be engaged for months and sometimes years, um, and we've seen a lot of resistance to those drugs uh, in a variety of settings across the world. Anything new on the drug space that's transformative, or is, are we dealing with iterations here? Are we doing sort of slightly better dots, or are we talking about an era where we'll actually move beyond dots? You know, I, I think when we start talking about what are we going to get out of a diagnostic and a drug, you can't separate that from the systems into which they're going. And um, so clearly, these, uh, the four-month quinolone-based regime is an incremental improvement, and we'll have a definitive answer on that fairly soon as to whether it's effective or not. Um, I think where the uh, transformation comes is when you're using truly new molecules. You know, these are agents that attack bugs in ways that they've never seen before. Uh, so that the so-called multi-drug resistant is essentially no different than susceptible TB because these are new agents, they work new ways. And, and there, are, there are a number of promising ones in the pipeline. Taking some of those and putting those together would mean that you have a new regimen which treats everyone, drug susceptible or drug resistant. And, and at least at the outset, you don't even need to do susceptibility testing. I think that's the transformation. But the challenge in all of this is, is how do you actually put it into a system where those new drugs are getting to the people who need it and not being abused in a way such that you lose them to resistance uh, rather quickly. So you make a case that the drugs are highly dependent on the system that's utilizing them. And yet a lot of the problems that we're seeing are in countries that have challenges in terms of health systems or India, where a substantial portion of patients actually seek their care through the private sector, which uh, is slightly regulated. Uh, any thought around how you, you put those two together? Like, how do we make sure that people get treated even when the systems of the countries in which they reside are, are not fully up to speed? Yeah, I, th I think one of, the, one of the really big challenges globally is it's private health care systems in, in some of these uh, countries. They're unruly and unregulated. Um, and uh, attempts to interact with them through regulation and badgering uh, have, have largely failed. So what, what's exciting to me are some of the social franchising approaches and some of the um, interface agency approaches, which, which actually approach the private sector on their terms rather than on the public health terms. Just say, what are the incentives? What are your current incentives that have you doing the wrong thing? And how can we tweak those incentives so that you'll do the right thing? Right now, in many countries, the private health care providers are incentivized to order tests and prescribe drugs. They're not incentivized to appropriately diagnose and treat TB. 
if you can somehow flip that incentive around, you know, in its most simple way, you'd say, I'll give you, you know, X rupees when you do the right thing. And as long as X is more than doing the wrong thing, then, then that will start to drive these people uh, towards, uh, towards doing the right thing in the absence of regulation. So I had understood that the Gates Foundation was financing a, a, a sort of a new approach in China that was in some ways trying to address that very issue, which is that uh, TB clinics and TB doctors <coughs> were often only partially paid for by the government, so they had to go out and raise part of the salary and part of the budget. And one of the ways they did that was sort of uh, re reimbursements from drug companies. Uh, so the incentive was to write a lot of prescriptions, but not necessarily to ensure full completion of treatment. So w what's, what's going on in, in China with that experiment? Have we learned anything about how to change these motivations? Yeah, so it's a really interesting story in China, and I'm you know, sort of uh, loath to describe it here where there are so many China experts. But as I understand it, China has radically privatized their health system. So in TB, what that means is that when a, a patient has TB, uh, they either end up in the public CDC system or they end up in what are largely privatized hospital systems. Um, what, uh, what the Gates experiment is looking at uh, in partnership with the government uh, is putting right up at the front uh, molecular drug resistance testing so that rather than patients uh, who are drug susceptible going into the private health system and being overtreated with fancy unnecessary drugs or drug resistant patients going into the public setting where they're undertreated with standard four drug therapy at the very first encounter you say if this is a drug susceptible person they will go out to the public system and get the standard four drug dots drug dots and if they're a, if they're drug resistant then they move into the to the hospital system where they get uh, you know, more complicated medications and treatments. And, and actually, it's, it's the, the program started in 2009. We've seen um, a, a fairly significant increase in appropriate treatments, uh, decreases in diagnostic delays, um, and importantly, significant decreases in out-of-pocket payments. Um, ironically, though, you know, if you squeeze these systems too hard so that no one's making any money, off of doing the right thing, then you find people abandoning TB altogether. And it's hard to then to even hire patients, to, or doctors to work on the TB clinics, and the hospital administrators are shutting down the TB wards and turning them into something that's more remunerative. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a, it's, once you start getting into this issue of incentives, they, they're, they're hard to fine tune, and, and, and you can fall off the rail on either side. Great, well I wanted to hear a little more about uh, your experiences in India, but I actually wanted to start the process for uh, questions from the audience because I can go on all day long, as most of you know. Uh, over here, uh, <coughs> we got a microphone coming to you from the from the back. That it's the Gates Foundation DFID ID, that there is some questioning about whether product development partnerships in that model can effectively bring new uh, products, vaccines, diagnostics, uh, drugs to the market. Um, is that observation correct? Is it general generalizable? Why? And what's your personal view about that? Yeah, so I have a strong view on this. I actually think that product development partnerships have been transformational in, uh, in bringing attention to diseases which would otherwise be neglected and have been neglected because there's simply no market for them. Um, I think they've been on a steep learning curve. And uh, you know, looking back over the work that we've funded, uh, as I have had the opportunity to tell Bill and Melinda themselves. I mean, we're over budget, we're behind schedule, and, uh, and, and I think that that's... Those are always fun. Those, those are not fun conversations. Um, but fundamentally, I think if you look at things like the gene expert, it would not have happened in the absence of find. And uh, uh, now, you know, the, the field's moving and evolving, and I think people are constantly trying different models, but, but I, I'm, I'm quite certain that in the TB space, m the progress that we have seen would not have happened in the absence of PDPs. 
And Peter, I understand that one of the things that, that Gates, as, as one of the major funders of a lot of these product development partnerships, is actually looking to find more crosstalk between them so they're not iso operating in isolation so that cohorts, for example, can be optimized, uh, clinical space, laboratory capacity, so that you're not having a TB system and a HIV system, and even with HIV, you have a vaccine system and a microbicide system. How is that happening, and is, it, is that meeting resistance, or is that supported by the PDPs? Yeah, so, so I have to say, for the last two years, which has been a dynamic period, I've had my head deeply down uh, in India, so I, I'm, I'm not probably the right person to address that, but my, my general sense is uh, that uh, forums such as Product Development Forum are increasingly bringing these groups together and, 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 and enforcing that dialogue, but uh, I, I'm really not the person. There are people in the, the room who are part of it who probably could address it. So, next question. In the middle over here. So, uh, I'm, I'm Jeff Dow. I have uh, two questions. Sorry, um, yeah, use um, the mic for the webcast. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So, my first question is, where do you see the role of treating latent TB? And do you think there's enough? I'm from the malaria space personally, and the influence of Gates in that space has been, I agree with you, transformative. But you compare total investment from the private sector in neglected diseases versus Western diseases, and there's still, I think, a disparity there, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so the first question is, what do I think about treating latent infection? You know, I, I think it's... Can you uh, tell us what you mean by latent infection? Too? Yeah, so, you know, tuberculosis uh, is, 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 like many infectious diseases, there you have to conceptually differentiate infection from disease. So were I to have uh, TB, which I can tell you for a fact that's another story, I, I don't have TB, uh, though I do have a cough, uh, you know, <laughs> Of 100 people, um, about 30 of you, uh, if we spend enough time together, would get infected. Now, of that 30, only about, uh, about three of you would move on, or three to 10 of you would move on to develop active disease. So, so it's this conceptually differentiating infection, and then this long period in which you're living with the germs in your body, but suffering no real consequences from that. And, and we think about a third of the world is living in that state. From the, uh, from the state of actually being ill with it, being symptomatic, having fever, cough, and being infectious to others. Since the epidemic is being driven by that latter group, the public health response has been really focused on that in high burden countries. Uh, in lower burden countries like the United States, there's a quite a strong emphasis on trying to find people who are latently infected and treating them uh, with six to nine months of a single drug isoniazid, or now the CDC has been doing some be beautiful studies that show you can actually treat this with uh, now as, as few as 12 doses. Um, but from a public health perspective in a high burden country, and I'll speak from the perspective of India because I know it best, the magnitude of the challenge of just finding those people who have active disease promptly and treating them appropriately is so daunting that they frankly can't stretch themselves to even think about the others. The one space where, the, where it gets some play is in the TB HIV world because with the, with the confluence of TB and HIV, the progression of the disease is so much greater that, that the juice is actually worth the squeeze. Um, I think for treatment of latent infection, to become a higher public health priority, you'll need a few things to happen. The first is that if you had a marker, not of who, which third of the world is infected, but which subset of that have incipient disease, and you could target that group, uh, that, would make a, that would make a huge difference, and I think that policy would be uptaken much quicker. Um, that requires some basic biology that NIH is now funding and uh, biomarker work. I think the second thing is if you had a drug which you could administer that didn't take six to nine months, if you had a safe, simple drug, then that would also uh, change the world's approach to treating latent infection 
but I will say that that drug would have to be a little bit less toxic than this glass of water in front of me because you're going to be giving it to a lot of healthy people, many of whom won't benefit from it. So it's a, it's, it's a high bar to cross. So you alluded to this. I know there's a second question pending around funding levels, but before we move to that one, how much do we know about this trigger that moves someone from latent to active disease? Uh, you know, in many parts of the world, people with TB are often people that are dealing with other difficult circumstances. They're drug users, they're migrants, they're prisoners, they're people that have a lot of stresses in their life. Do we, do we know uh, if there's any connection? Why is it that I have latent and somebody else gets active? Yeah. Um, we know a uh, scanty little about that. I mean, and, and, and it, it speaks to the broader principle that in TB we have actually this thin veneer. Of, of science upon which we've been groping to try and get these new tools. And I think we've been successful, but, but the, this issue of latency becoming active disease uh, is one in which the, there's a vast fund of ignorance. I think we, there's been a really important transformation in that field, which is to not sort of dichotomize the world into you're infected and I'm not, and realize that there are all, there's a whole gradient you know, you may have just a few bacteria, I may have, you know, a bunch of bacteria, but we're both latently infected. Uh, and, and, and this has really profoundly uh, advanced the approaches to, to understanding it and also to intervening. So it's, it's not that progress isn't being made, it's, uh, it's just that we have a long way to go. And you would think that might be one of the things that would be useful for vaccine uh, developers to understand what it is that that's triggered and see if there's some way to, to engage to, to stop that progression. Yeah, I mean, you talked about polarization between the different PDPs, but I think, you know, the bringing the scientific disciplines together in a synthetic way so that, you know, the, the same immunologic investigations that will tell you why someone is protected and help you make a vaccine could also tell you, you know, why someone uh, is, um, you know, how, how to detect that someone is latently infected or not, uh, and, and perhaps even tell you, you know, what part of the immune system do you want your antibiotic to kind of nudge a little bit? So, so you know, they all converge in, in a way, uh, and it's, it's kind of gratifying to see how, in the same way that some of the PDPs are coming together and having conversations, increasingly, you know, basic science is, is, is really becoming a much more integrated field. And do the HIV and the TB people talk? I mean, you know, the, you, some of what you just said, you could just strip out TB and put in HIV. Um, in terms of vaccine research, um, how much connection? Obviously, there one is a bacteria, there is a virus, and uh, malaria. You've got a parasite, but are there are there conversations between these different disease groups that should be happening or are happening? Yeah, not enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions. Why don't I do a couple? We had a bunch of hands up, so why don't we just do a few in a row and then you can remember them because you have photographic uh, good memory. Good luck. Yeah, hi, David Bryden with results. On behalf of Stop TV Partnership, I just wanted to ask about USAID's role in the space of R&D in particular. I'd love to get your perspective on that, you know, especially in light of the budget proposal from the president to cut USAID's money you know, by 20%. Would that have, in your view, a negative impact on, on the ability to, to pursue greater uh, investment in R&D or to help countries roll out some of the new technologies that we're excited about and and what what's behind that proposal if you have any thoughts about that yeah let me, let me just answer that question quickly because you know I, I think that uh, TB is under resourced there's there's no question about that um, I I think that, that that the space that USAID can occupy in R&D is in the operational research ends you know they they, they they actually have on-the-ground presence in many of the most heavily affected areas. And, and so I think they have an incredible opportunity to help us, not with just coming up with these tools, but, but actually figuring out how to use them. So, so I do think that, uh, that increasing resources are critical. Hello, I'm Shungita Mukherjee. I'm an assistant professor at George Washington University. Is it working? Can folks hear? I, I hear you, but I don't think it's through the mic. Yeah, it says it says it's on. Okay. Um, so I, I was just, and you just touched upon this in terms of uh, answering that question about AID's role in operational research, um, and and you referred to it in terms of new 
developments of new technologies, especially molecular types of drugs. I find that we also have a vast amount of ignorance around many of the, the non-technical issues surrounding TB control and management. And I, I have worked um, years ago with a program on understanding incentives and enablers for TB. And it was very hard to figure out who would fund that kind of research. So when we're talking about TB R&D, what about the other kinds of R um, that can help inform how these technologies won't go to seed in 10 or 15 years? I mean, I'll, I'll just answer that very personally because I, you know, I was, my, I, I started in a lab looking at, well, you know, I spent a decade as a doctor and then a decade as a scientist at Stanford and then a decade developing drugs and, and um, my two years in India have completely changed all of that in terms of uh, your question. I, I think it's a critical question and, and, uh, and I don't have a good answer for it, but it is clear that, that all of these investments mean nothing until you get them out there to the people who need them. And, and stitching all of that together is, is actually an incredible opportunity of, the, of, I think, the U.S. government, frankly, because <clears throat> in a way, you know, this kind, this transition that we're at in TB control where where you know it, we, we know that DOTS isn't going fi to finish the job, but we are not exactly sure how to modernize it. But we do know we have all the putty we need. We have the technologies, we have the health systems, you know, we have you know, experiences like what you've evidently contributed it to in terms of how do you change uh, provider behaviors uh, and, and patient behaviors, health-seeking behaviors. You know, I was really thrilled to see the gene expert take a test turnaround time from six weeks to two hours until someone pointed out that actually there were seven months before the patient sought care <laughs> and that the marginal impact was pretty trivial. So, you know, to somehow stringing this all together is, is, is a tough puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and so, you know, how Can you does repeat the question because she wasn't on the mic? Yeah, so for my mother who's on, yes. on, on, <coughs> on the... Uh, Sorry, Mrs. Small. <laughs> Uh, the question was when it only tests for resistance uh, to, ref to one drug, rifampin. I mean, absolutely, you know. It's an incredibly imperfect breakthrough, right? And that's the way it's going to happen. It's not, we're not going to wake up one day with a point of care test that you dip in your urine and, and the one pill that you can get at the corner drugstore. You know, it's going to be a, a long slog of incremental improvement. So. to help us with those incremental improvements. That's a huge frustration for a lot of us who would like to contribute. Yeah. So that, uh, let me answer for Peter. Um, <laughs> Thank uh, you. And Thank speak you. on behalf of the Gates Foundation. So <laughs> two things I'm really ineligible to do. Uh, you know, one thing that's interesting, you know, uh, is to see how the foundation has transformed even in the last couple of years. I mean, hiring uh, Chris Elias, the former head of PATH, whose focus was delivering technologies into the developing world uh, and really expanding the footprint of the foundation and looking at the delivery space, as it would call it, is actually a, a big deal. Uh, it's a, it is a, a major acknowledgement that developing new things uh, is critical and that's probably still the foundation's core space. But if you don't pay attention to how you get those to the people that need them, then they sit on shelves and the history is certainly replete with examples of that. So I, I do think that that's that's important. I do also know that one of the things that Bill and Melinda have been very clear about is the foundation can't be financing the delivery of these things. That is not its space. That's governments, mostly development country governments and our government to the extent that we can help. Uh, but this, this connection uh, you know, between NIH and AID even here in DC is, is critical. So let, we'll go on from there. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm Sandy Dwali. I'm a public health consultant. There has been a call, renewal call for child survival. So I wonder if you can comment on the magnitude of TB in children and what are some of the challenges you see in the field? You know, the, 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 the biggest challenge with uh, what we can say about TB in children is how little we can say about TB in children. And I think we've suffered from um, this kind of I don't know, call it a catch-22 or whatever, chicken and egg thing, wherein 
it's actually very difficult to diagnose TB in children because we generally think of TB as pneumonia, and we get pneumonia samples by having people cough and spit. And you can't get five-year-olds and below to cough and spit. <clears throat> so, so we've not been able to diagnose. You haven't been around my nephew. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> cough and spit in a cup <laughs> on demand <laughs> when not in the presence of talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Point taken. Um, so, so because we can't diagnose it, the world has tended to assume it doesn't exist. And, and because they assume it doesn't exist, then they don't feel the need to invest in diagnosing it. Right? So we're in that kind of a catch-22. And, and, and I, I don't know what the way out is, but, uh, but I'm hopeful that some of the science that's being invested in, in biomarkers will give us non-sputum-based diagnostic tests. And that'll be the critical breakthrough for pediatric TB. When you can diagnose TB with a blood sample, uh, it's, uh, it'll be a lot easier to diagnose TB in kids. But it is, I believe, it's one of the top 10 causes of child mortality. Uh, so it's way high up in the list. And uh, one of our interns was doing some research on this very question. It turns out that we don't really have any kind of uh, pharmacokinetic studies on children. So we basically use adult doses and divide by weight, uh, which is an interesting approach. Uh, we don't really have any sense around how to do diagnosis, you know, so we're, uh, while we're dealing with the adults in a 19th century approach, it feels like we're going even farther back in history and dealing with uh, kids, even though it's a major cause of, of child mortality. So uh, an area of, uh, of hopefully some increased attention. Uh, next question, and then we'll, we'll move uh, out of this row. We can pass the <laughs> microphone around. Okay. Um, I've got, I'm going to make a comment about... Um, poor yield in TB diagnosis. I started doing autopsies on TB in 1980 in Kinshasa. I spent five years at Project CEDA. And that's when we discovered that TB was what was killing a third of the people. I just have been working the last five years in Uganda in Kampala. TB is still killing, undiagnosed TB is still killing a third of the people who um, die in the hospital. People don't like to think about dead bodies, so they don't look at what people die of. And um, unless you do that, you don't really know the real data. Verbal autopsies are not an autopsy in a pathologist's point of view. But I think, um, and I just shared a paper with him, it's in PLOS in Uganda. And um, I think it's people would be shocked about how much TB, disseminated TB is not even considered in the diagnosis in people with HIV in Africa. So let me throw a question to you before you lose the microphone. So uh, since I don't really have any technical background, I often answer technical questions. Interns asked me today, like, how good are these child mortality statistics anyway? <laughs> so uh, I gave her an answer, but I won't tell you what it was. So tell me <laughs> what's your answer. Well, the answer we say is the verbal autopsy is an excellent tool for demographic data, but a very poor tool for specific disease. So when we say that TB is the number 10 killer of children, that's largely a guesstimate. Yes. There have been a few studies of TB autopsies in children in South Africa, and it's usually in children over two who are HIV positive who die of TB. In under two, it's more likely to be pneumocystis or bacterial pneumonia. Mm. Thank you. Over, over here, and then uh, we'll move to the back, and then uh, Steve Morrison gets to ask a question since he signs our paychecks. Uh, I'd like to thank Peter again. And uh, I remember when I met you in uh, Delhi, I advocated for one of the uh, diagnostic which applied signature mapping has developed the TBDX, the microscopic uh, uh, um, diagnostic kit. Uh, you see, the gene expert is also, if you compare the data, you have to have a, a gold standard, the microscopic uh, uh, validation. So what do you think about this still? Why uh, it's not a, people are adopting that technology? Because it minimizes the time as well as the accuracy of the detection of bacilli is almost 99%. One question. And uh, whatever you did in India is really a great contribution. I recently visited Dr. Ashok Kumar and Chauhan. They were mentioning about you. 
And the another thing is MDR TV uh, cases are increasing. It's because of the co-infection uh, of uh, HIV and TV, or what is your opinion about that? Yeah, so, so first of all, I will say generically about any diagnostic tool that its impact is, is entirely dependent on the system in which to you put it and how you, and, and fundamentally no one in the world knows where the best place in either the diagnostic algorithm or in the health system to deploy any of the new tests. I mean, we know enough to get started, right? We know enough to, to try it here, there, and, and there, but it, it then has to be iterated. And I think the same is gonna be true for the system that, that you and I have discussed previously, which is sort of computer-driven um, image analysis. Um, so uh, in, in terms of uh, what I've done in India, I have to say uh, it's, it's been an incredible experience for me, mind-blowing in many ways. Um, but I don't really know what I've done, but I do know what India has done in the last couple of years, and, and the policy landscape has entirely changed. So, you know, what they've done is they've written an ambitious strategic plan, uh, which calls for universal treatment, MDR and HIV included. Uh, this is a this is a, a remarkable advance over the we're going to find you know some percentage of the cases and cure some percentage of that you know th th this, and and for a program the size of India to make that bold a statement was was really I think very brave of them you know they've also been very frank about the problems they're going to going to face and and I think that the uh, that some of the progress they've made uh, in other policy spaces making TB reporting mandatory creating an electronic database that's web-based, name-based, uh, and allows or will allow when it's deployed uh, tracking of cases uh, and, um, uh, and, and the making, outlawing these worthless blood tests which are used in more than 90% of private labs. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's been phenomenal to watch, uh, to watch the changes in India over the last couple of years. So MDR, uh, we haven't spent much time talking about that. We were just in, uh, some colleagues and I were in South Africa recently, and we witnessed Gene Expert being deployed in Durban and uh, Koresha Karim's uh, clinic there. Uh, Brian Brink, uh, a friend of ours who is the medical director for Anglo, uh, one of the largest employers in Africa. They deal a lot with TB, obviously. Uh, one of the things that he states over and over, particularly at Global Fund board meetings, is that MDR is simply uh, a sign of failed TB treatment, that it's just simply poor TB treatment uh, manifest, uh, rather than necessarily being connected to HIV, because you always see MDR where there isn't uh, necessarily a lot of prevalence of HIV. There has been this big question about whether or not, given limited resources, we should focus on MDR. Uh, it is 10 to 20 times more expensive, at least using the current drugs and the current protocols, uh, as opposed to putting the, the money into regular dots uh, and regular TB treatment. Uh, hopefully, we won't have to make that choice. Uh, but I, I'm wondering if you give us your thoughts around MDR and, and, and also then what you saw in India. They were dinged recently in a New York Times article to their approach to MDR. Um, a, any reaction there? It is one of the highest number of MDR cases in the world in that country. Yeah, so, so MDR is a huge problem. I mean, I wouldn't minimize it for a minute. It's, it's a catastrophe for the individuals involved and it's, um, and it's, uh, it's a nightmare for the budgets. You know, India is spending about 45% of their budget on 3 to 4% of their patients. That's just not sustainable. Um, and, and, and there's no reason why those, and that's driven by the cost of these second line drugs. And is that a market issue or is that, a, is that the, the product is fundamentally more expensive? It is a fundamentally more expensive product, which is a way exacerbated by an incredibly broken market. So, so, you know, it, the, the Global Fund, which has done a fantastic job, really transformed in many ways the treatment of TB, funds 80 to 90 percent of, uh, of donor assistance. Uh, they are really well situated to work with U.S. government agencies to try and change that market dynamic and drive those prices down. They're generic drugs. They've been around for 40 years. Um, and, uh, and I think that that that's a that's a clear 
clear issue that will help uh, somewhat with, with the deployment of, uh, of diagnosis. But I think if you look, for example, at the paper, the New England Journal paper that was published out of China, where they said, look, it's no longer just about compliance. The cat is out of the bag, and you know, we're seeing primary drug resistance, which means these are not people who start off drug susceptible, don't take their medicine, and become drug resistant. These are the people you know, who are drug resistant from the get-go. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so what, what China is saying is, look, we need to diagnose and, uh, and, and drug resistance at the first interaction and get people on the right treatment. I think this is a big challenge, but I think it's, you know, the tools are lining up, the, the political will is lining up, and uh, so I, it's a huge problem, I wouldn't minimize it, but I, I, there are uh, days when I'm optimistic. Good to hear. Uh, question, over here. Oh, sorry, Dr. Morrison, the microphone's down there. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, two quick things. One is you've had a, f a front row seat on the drama in, in India, and you've talked a bit about it. <coughs> but it's also been prone to, to quite a bit of turmoil and convulsion in the last two years. And you, you talk about what's driving that. Um, and the second thing is what's the message to Congress or the executive agencies about what the one or two top priorities should be in terms of U.S. policy in the next five years on TV. Thank you. Yeah, those are easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, India is an, is an amazingly vibrant place. <laughs> and uh, uh, while at the same time you're seeing this massive advancement in policy, uh, the day-to-day -day execution against that policy is challenging. And, and uh, all you have to do is read uh, you know, Betsy McKay and Gita Nan's story in the Wall Street Journal to, 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 to understand uh, the flip side of the progress. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't, I can't explain it, right? It's, 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 it's uh, it, those of you who, who read Indian literature will know Rohinton Mystery's book called A Fine Balance, and he refers to it as a fine balance between hope and despair. And I, I think all of us who are too, trying to do hard things uh, would see it that way. You know, what, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, uh, difficult things are difficult. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I've been incredibly impressed by the technical people and their commitment to make things better. And, and what I feel we as a global community have failed to do is to provide them the assistance that they need. Yeah, it's a booming economy, or at least it was until recently, but it started pretty low. You know, yes, they're increasing their TB budget, but you know, they're still spending about $115 per patient. Puts them right on the bottom rung. Uh, so they need resources. We can't pretend that this is some BRICS phenomena and they don't need assistance in the short term. I think we, you know, India will transition uh, to a self-sustained uh, system, but they need a lot of technical assistance in, 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 in the interim. And so how to provide that kind of technical assistance and, and the role of WHO, Stop TV Partnership, USAID and others is, is something that, 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 that merits very deep thought, and, and I don't have any quick answers. Um, in, in terms of, of U.S. policy, I, I, uh, I think the most important thing is that, that we as a country have to recognize that TB is and remains a huge problem, and that TB anywhere is TB everywhere, and that, the, that we're at this transition where we need to modernize interventions. And, and we, as a country, have been pioneers in these innovations, in, in getting the drugs, the diagnostics, in, in figuring out how to work in complicated systems. And, and so I, I would say that now is actually the time when the U.S. needs to actually redouble our effort, when it's easy to say, well, we've been doing it for a long time, let's back off. I think that that, that would be a catastrophe. Thanks, Alicia. Where'd you go? Up oh, over here. We'll pass around this column for a while, and then we'll move over to the middle. Hi, thank you for being here today. I'm Josh Glasser with the Department of State. I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how 
uh, the rapid and transformational um, changes in uh, society and the environment in India are interacting with some of these uh, biomedical and public health developments that you've been talking about? Yeah, so um, the environment of India is a heterogeneous place if we're talking about the physical environment. Uh, you know, living in, in Delhi, quite close to an open sewer, and having just spent a week in Leh Ladakh, uh, one of the most gorgeous, pristine places I've ever been, um, India is, once again, incredibly complicated and incredibly heterogeneous. Uh, I think if we're talking about the human environment, uh, the big challenge that India epitomizes is urbanization. Uh, DOTS has always been focused on the rural situation, and I'm not sure anyone, uh, with the possible exception of New York City, and that was done at a different time and a different budget, know how to control TB uh, in, uh, in the urban context where all of the environmental issues are colluding against you. Uh, again, the policy environment in India is quite, um, quite encouraging because while they've had a national rural health mission for many years, uh, it's only in the last uh, month that they've announced and launched a national urban health mission. I think getting uh, TB and other infectious diseases addressed uh, and understanding the, the sort of the unique characteristics and uh, possibilities in urban settings is, is going to be one of the big challenges. It's interesting to, to know, sort of see the, almost the opposite of China, uh, you know, which uh, sort of gave up doing a lot of rural health care and focused on urban health care and then realized a little bit late that they had left too much off in terms of rural health care and are now reinvesting in that area. Um, other questions over here? Thank you. New Lamar with American Thoracic Society. So we've talked a little about uh, TB in children, but then we also know that it's also a major uh, killer in women um, and, and is actually one of the, the leading killers of, of women of reproductive age. Um, so I, I wonder what your perspective would be on, you know, why or, or how TB um, hasn't um, focused in and the prioritization with maternal and child health issues? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, there were uh, an estimated 1.4 million deaths from TB in the last year, and, and at least half a million of them were in women. And that does make it one of the, one of the, one of the big killers. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I don't pose to understand much. But I certainly don't understand advocacy and, 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 and how that link has failed to happen is, is mystifying and needs to be rectified. Um, I, I think the link to children is another one because it's not just disease. It's the fact that, you know, when, you know, I, I kind of, okay, so I'm a, I'm a sensitive guy and all, but I don't cry a lot. And uh, I, I um, was with Bill Gates in South Africa at Did Bill the, make you cry? <laughs> Yeah, we was at the King George Hospital, which is, you know, a, a five-story building just overflowing with drug-resistant cases. And, 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 and the pediatric ward was, uh, just brought tears to my eyes. There were these kids, one, two years old, who were, uh, you know, they, they had so few muscles they could hardly find them. They were getting these painful intramuscular injections. And, and I realized that this is really what we're doing. You know, we're, there are all these MDR orphans whose only legacy from their parents is that they are infected with germs which are multi-drug resistant. Anyhow, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think, it's, um, I think it's, it's incredible, right? I mean, it's, how do we let this happen? And so the whole idea of being TB free on your fifth birthday is something which, which just needs to, to get some traction. Not necessarily disease free, but infection free. But I suspect the issue with women is connected to the comment you made earlier around latency and actually uh, seeking care. Uh, certainly I know more about the HIV space, but women are often the last to seek care for themselves and put everybody else ahead of the line. And sometimes that's by choice and sometimes it's not by choice. They're sort of pushed to the back of the line. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, one of the challenges here is, is understanding how much of it is uh, is, is that sort of situational uh, issue uh, or discriminatory uh, issue and how much biological is do you have there any sense is there is there a difference in terms of biological receptivity for for women 
Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I don't think so. I think that, that pregnancy is a slightly immunosuppressing event and, and that there's some relationship there. But I, for the most part, my understanding is it's mostly environmental. But, but I could be totally wrong on that. So uh, let's move up here to the front row. Uh, and then we'll uh, come over here and then we'll go to the middle. Hi, my name is Mandy, and I work at Results uh, with the Action Partnership. And I'm so excited everyone's talking about women and children in TB, because uh, three years ago when I started working on that issue, I could barely get anyone to answer a question on it. Um, so my question is a bit more about what happened in India in January of 2012 uh, with the emergence of what some call totally drug-resistant TB. Um, that report came out, and then there was contradictory reports from the Indian government saying, oh no, it's not totally drug resistant, it's just extra extensively resistant. And then there was this WHO meeting where they had to figure out how resistant was this resistant strain. And there was a, a pretty big contradiction between media reports and what the government was saying, and there basically seems to remain that contradiction till this day. So my question is, when do we start freaking out? Because you're talking about a completely resistant strain. I mean, uh, we're, we're not coming up with antibiotics fast enough to outsmart the bacteria that we're dealing with. So why aren't we being louder and freaking out about it? Yeah. Um, so I was around during all that time, and uh, it was interesting because it happened after an international meeting uh, a mission, uh, which had been to Mumbai and came back, and Ken Castro from CDC said, it's New York City all over again. And uh, Mumbai is a really special case in India in terms of our awareness of it. I hope it's a genuinely a special case, and it does, it's not just the tip of a bigger iceberg. Um, but I think what you saw are kind of expected uh, political responses. Um, so let's not talk about the problem. Let's talk about the name and things like that, which, you know, we just, this is, this is to be expected. I, there are two things. One is I, I think actually the immediate attention uh, was critical in pushing through that and getting to the heart of the game, which was that the TB control program in Mumbai needed to be radically revamped. The other thing which is more encouraging to me is that Mumbai is doing that. So they've held meetings, uh, they've now launched a plan which is an integrated urban response. It includes strengthening the public sector as well as the private sector, and bringing in IT and other, other things. So uh, you know, if there's a silver lining to that cloud, it's, it's that it has precipitated uh, a response, and, and Mumbai is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is the right place to take it on because uh, it's a relatively affluent city which, uh, which can afford uh, to, to try and do some new things. And if those things are found to work, uh, then the question becomes how does the country scale them up? And, and this is uh, encouraging to see discussions between the World Bank and India uh, about resources to do that. Over here. Thank you, Elena McEwan, Catholic Relief Services. I just want to comment a little bit about the women, and for us, what we have found is a lack of opportunities or missed opportunity because the women are the ones who come every every time the child is sick, but the health system fails to ask if they have any symptoms. We did an operations research in the Philippines, and what we found is that the the, the female patients were more likely to be asked to bring the contacts than the male patients. So there are some interesting information there to see what are the missed opportunities the system is failing to ask the women. But my question is, can you make comments about the role of community in TB prevention and control? Yeah, only to say it's insufficient. Um, it's, uh, it's a complicated chain of causality that, that starts with someone becoming infected or symptomatic or seeking care and getting the right care and, uh, and, and it's unclear who holds the system accountable for that whole chain working and I, I think that the, one of the great things about the community is that, that they can have a really unique oppor 
impact at, at, at many of those stages where the more traditional medicalized approaches have simply failed. Um, in, uh, it's been really interesting for me, Todd mentioned the evolution of the Gates Foundation. Um, and one of the evolutions of the Avahan program has been to start off thinking of this as, as a fairly uh, straightforward intervention. And, and now it's a, a significant portion of what the foundation has been doing in India about HIV is community mobilization. So it's something which, again, my time in India has really changed my mind on. It was interesting to see when they started, it was an H Avahan as an HIV prevention program. Uh, and, and they went in with uh, a full set of uh, slides from a well-known consulting firm uh, and found quickly that uh, although Chevron didn't result in impact, um, so they switched and actually one of the areas, one of the big things they were finding was a gender violence hotline uh, that was intended to allow women uh, a, a, an opportunity to engage the, uh, some system to help them when they were suffering from uh, gender violence. And that actually turned out to be, through a lot of studies, one of the most effective HIV uh, prevention interventions that they had. But that certainly didn't show up on the original slide set. So I think there is a lot of learning here. Um, I, I think Bill and Melinda have also spent a lot of time in India. And they certainly heard from people and witnessed themselves that, back to your point, the technologies are important. But it's a community that allows those things to make or break, that supports a woman to get in, to get a diagnosis, and to get treated. Um, all those things happen at the community level, not so much at the, at the research platform. And I just, would just add that you know, I, I don't think that, that in, certainly in the TB space, you'll see the foundation moving away from the promise of science and technology, but rather expanding to incorporate uh, the issues of, of delivery. You know, at the end of the day, it's that integrated approach. Uh, if you have a, a point of care test, it makes all of the all the other parts easier, uh, and so how one iterates that entire spectrum in integrated fashion is is, is really I think where where at least the TV program is going. Thanks. Other questions? <coughs> Over here. Hi, Mary Lou Fisher with Samaritan's Purse. Thank you for your talk. Uh, as with malaria drugs, there is a certain amount that are not. I don't know if you call them counterfeit or what is the right uh, word to call them. Is this a problem with uh, TB drugs? And if so, how big of a problem is it in your experience? Well, I, th I think in the public health system, it's, it's, it's not a problem. The, 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 uh, but in the private sector, drug control is an incredible issue. And, and I don't know, frankly, how much drug resistance that we're seeing emerging in India or anywhere for that matter, is due to patients being prescribed the wrong medicine, for them being prescribed the right medicine but actually being given inferior quality or insufficient dosing, or how much of it is just that they are you know, failing to adhere. Uh, and so the, 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 the most candid answer is that I, 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 we don't know. Uh, if you're ever in Delhi, uh, I, sh I would recommend I can give you the coordinates of the uh, drug market in, in Old Delhi, uh, where you see unlicensed medical practitioners wandering around with burlap bags full of drugs that they're buying and uh, reselling at seven times the increase in price. And uh, I don't know whether those drugs, whether it would be better from a public health perspective if they were all actually water <laughs> or not. But I, I can assure you it's, it's a terrifying scene. We did actually at CSIS, we had a, uh, a similar session to this a few weeks ago with uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, and the FDA. Uh, the Institute of Medicine just did a report around fake and substandard medicines. Um, and uh, TB drugs or anti-TB drugs were cited as one of those where there is a lot of uh, fake drugs going on. But as you said, depends on the system. They are in the public system, certainly in some places. The Global Fund has struggled with that. Uh, you know, public sectors often have weak supply chains, but they're definitely more robust often than the private sector, which just seems in many of these countries to go without much regulation at all. Uh, hmm. In that report, they note that there have been connections made between the presence of fake or substandard TB drugs and the development of resistance, but uh, it feels more like supposition than actually the conclusion of, uh, of research. So 
it's more like there are fake drugs, there is resistance, so maybe there's a connection rather than evidence that shows that connection. Uh, questions over here in the middle? Cesar Munaiko from Unifor Service University. What is uh, your opinion about uh, targeting hotspot? In the, is, is there any experience in India? This is uh, during the last Global Fund board meeting. It was a week or so ago in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mark Dybul, uh along with uh, Lucica from uh, Stop TB and uh, uh, Rob from uh, WHO Malaria Program, were talking about this new super hotspot approach, uh, which I thought was interesting since our data are often so weak. But there, there are apparently in some places good enough data to sort of drive down to a very micro level and focus your efforts there. Yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think it's great. I mean, I, I think that when we look to modernize dots, we have a, only a limited number of opportunities, but each of them are really quite powerful. It, and, and one is to acknowledge that one size fits none. And, and, and to really say that, that, you know, how do we target one area where things are being driven by the private sector differently than another where, where the epidemic is being driven by, say, HIV or, or MDR? So I, I think that that's a, that's a critically important issue. But I think you also have to put it in the context of um, you know, we have to get away from being comfortable with uncertainty and demanding precision and quality. So it's no longer a question of finding someone in whom you see a bacteria, hoping it's drug susceptible, giving them four drugs, and knowing two months later that you were right or wrong. It's like we have to know the first touch with the right test that these are the people who need these drugs or those drugs and get them on them. And I, I think the third one really speaks also to the point you raised, which is that uh, we, can't, um, we can't pretend anymore that we know what to do, right? We, we certainly know enough to get started, but if we're not learning in real time and getting smarter every day, and, and that smartness is it's a different smarts in one place than another, then we're simply not going to make progress. Yeah, and I, just to add, I think that there's a lot of evidence where the data are only part of the picture. And even when you have the data, um, there are other factors that relate. So you know, when you have a country where the TB is hitting populations that are uh, illegal or migrant or otherwise sort of ostracized, you know, having data that shows they're at risk doesn't seem to drive attention to their needs. So uh, you know, the hotspots uh, approach, which is certainly a data-centric approach, is still going to run into this resistance of sort of addressing people that have needs and sort of getting over the political or cultural issues that sort of keep them somehow from not getting served. So it'll be an interesting challenge. You know, just to speak, uh, just a kind of quick personal anecdote. Um, when I moved to India, I was, I was shocked to hear that people who have protracted coughs weren't seeking care. And I wasn't quite sure how someone could be so stupid. And then I, um, I have asthma. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I, after a cold, I, I, I took my usual uh, 10 days of oral prednisone, and the cough kind of went away. And about two weeks after that, uh, you know, being an ID doc and having a persistent cough, I figured, well, this must be a post-viral uh, bacterial infection. So I, I found three days of uh, outdated azithro in my uh, closet, and I took that. Speaking of burlap bags. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and. Um, and, and, you know, being fundamentally human, after that failed to work, I, I just started chugging quietly cough medicine at work. And uh, one day my, uh, my roommate, uh, in my office mate, busted me on and he said, you know, Peter, you're coughing a lot. And you've been spending a lot of time in these hospitals. And sometimes it's not just TB, it's MDR and XDR TB. And aren't you worried? And it hit me like a ton of bricks that if I had walked into my ID clinic at Stanford, I would not let me finish a sentence before I put a mask on me. And yet I'd been like living with my family, my uh, young kids for, for six weeks coughing, and uh, I, was, I was a TV suspect. And the amazing thing, though, which made this story really gratifying, is that uh, we have been working with Chai on increasing access to gene expert through the private lab networks in India. So there are now uh, 13 laboratories and actually maybe 30 labs in a network that, so 30,000 uh, collection sites, 3,000 collection sites where you can go and get a gene expert and the price is guaranteed to not exceed a ceiling. 
Uh, and so I went to one of those labs and, and I walked out 17 minutes later with a digital chest x-ray and a gene expert cooking and they SMSed me later that, uh, that just the next day and, and said I didn't have TB. And, and you know, it was, it was really one of these things. Or where, you have XDR-TB, time to freak out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually was convinced that I had XDR-TB. My wife was a physician and, and is generally pretty good at talking me down, was out of the country for the week and I was just... My kids were like, you know, Dad, when are you going to get that green expert? And uh, <laughs> leaving notes, do you have TB? I mean, it was, became like a family drama. Anyhow. So, you know, this whole issue about, about how you get people to seek care and, and uh, you know, it, when you find those hot spots, you know, what's, what's, what's different about uh, asthmatic, uh, retired Stanford academics than, you know, the, the people, the others out there, and how do you get to all of them? I, I, it's, it's important. Uh, in the back, Alicia, so can you both ask a question and we'll... Uh... Yeah, Ambassador Don Bandler. Um, 1972, I decided that, you know, my wife and I should go to Nigeria and see what it looked like. And um, the, the malaria was immediately whacked um, and uh, we, we you know we, we asked and what's going on and how and what can we do about it and there really wasn't much to say uh, in their health uh, universe so uh, I don't know it's just it was just a uh, we're still alive <laughs> but it was it was uh, it was very it, it's surprisingly to me that we didn't get the uh, the amount of uh, the right kinds of drugs, what and you know, really make it change a change. Yeah. I mean, Nigeria is one of the countries that's also addressing a lot of the TB. They have malaria widely. They have a high utilization of the private sector. Uh, and you know, you were talking around diagnosis and sort of getting that you know initial point to be diagnosis and moving forward. That clearly has been the effort with malaria, um, but they have been really challenged, Nigeria especially, because so many people seek care through the private sector and getting the private sector to utilize a diagnostic before they give you the drug that they sell uh, is a real challenge. India uh, the same. So maybe you can comment a little bit around you know how you think there is an opportunity to utilize the private sector. And you mentioned before incentives. This is about making this profitable for country companies to, to be able to diagnose effectively. And how do you stop the profit from selling the drug that they don't need? Yeah, so the first thing that we've done, which has been great fun, is we've been, uh, a few of us have been spending a lot of time with these private doctors, just going out and you know, learning how their business model works. And um, we're calling this the Freakonomics of TV care. Because if I were uh, poor and sick in India, I would have really three options. I can go to the public sector, I can go to an unqualified private doctor, I can go to a qualified doctor. So just taking the unqualified private doctor, because if I'm poor, that's where I'll probably start because it's cheaper. I would pay, and you're the doctor, I would pay you 30 rupees uh, for the visit and think that, wow, I'm getting a lot of service for 30 rupees. You would order 600 rupees of tests. You'd order chest x-ray, sed ray, and CBC. Um, that would be done on a, on a form. Uh, and when I took it to the lab, your signature would ensure that 40% of that money came back to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then, you know, if, uh, if, if the drugs kickback is not so straightforward, but, but what you realize is, and then at a certain point, if I'm not getting sick, you don't want me around because that looks bad, right? And uh, you, you, so then you will refer me to another doctor. And at that point, uh, you'll actually um, get about 40% of the fee that I pay him kicked back to you as well. So when we start to see lots of referrals amongst the private sector, you, you know, you realize, well, it's an inevitable consequence of this business model. So what we're doing, it, it's kind of fun, actually. We're working with the Indian S uh, School of Business to, to, to actually model all of this and try and say, like, if these were shoes you're selling and you're trying to optimize this function, then what would you change? And we've stuck into this something which is in the National Strategic Plan. It's a private provider interface agency. It, it, without getting into any of the technicalities of it, it's basically it's a group who have separate relationships with the lab and with the druggist and with the uh, providers. And they, they then uh, would 
tweak that model by, for instance, paying you more money to do the right tests or helping you to get the sputum from your office to the right lab. Uh, and these are models which are just being, you know, equil so we're doing two things. We're, we're working with academic modelers and then we're funding groups to actually go out and just make it work. So we're going to see how these models equilibrate in the real world and how closely that tracks to what the analytics suggests. And then we'll have the crosstalk between them. And, and uh, so it, it, it's, it's just an experiment. And, um, but I think it's these kind of experiments where you start by say, putting yourself in the mindset. Because what we fundamentally what we learned is when, if you're a doctor and I'm coughing, I'm worth <coughs> about uh, 450 rupees. If I have TB, my little Google Glass is going to be starting to estimate when I'm yes. talking to you how much I'm going to get out yes, of this transaction. Yes, exactly. And if I have TB, you know, I'm worth about three thousand rupees, right? Now, the, the the government of India has for fifteen years said that if you will refer the patient to them, and then complete treatment of them with um, with the uh, dots, you'll get two hundred and fifty rupees, and they're not getting a lot of takers. Three thousand is more than two fifty. <clears throat> Yes, I'm Dr. Jennifer Platt with WASH Advocates, Water and Sanitation Hygiene Advocate. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the earlier question regarding the impact of the environment, and you need to discuss the need to address urban situations. Of course, uh, safe sanitation and hygiene only exacerbate the spread when they aren't present. Um, I'd like to know if there are any examples of TB control efforts that are integrated to also address sanitation and hygiene, otherwise, we're missing a key opportunity to mitigate the spread. Yeah, I'm not aware of any. Um, I think that <clears throat> TB being an airborne disease uh, probably has slightly, would have different implications in terms of water and sanitation than uh, some of the sort of the more common enteric uh, infections that I've become familiar with. Hygiene meaning like cough hygiene and uh, yeah. So you know, infection control is a really good point because we have not really good handle on how much TB is being transmitted in aggregate settings and what the potential impact would be of of infection control. So I, I could totally. I, totally I do think this is one of the things that PEPFAR has looked at quite a bit with the CDC, which is. Uh, uh, how to understand basic steps they can take to reduce the likelihood that patients <coughs> waiting for AIDS treatment are somehow then uh, susceptible to the person sitting next to them who happens to also have TB. Uh, again, going back to South Africa, we were in a very rural health clinic and they took this very simple step, which is their waiting room was outside, uh, covered but open air, uh, and they had appointment slots so that people weren't sort of coming in the morning and spending the entire day together. So just trying to reduce the load. And the actual patient count in the clinic was quite low. You saw very few patients inside. Uh, most of them were waiting outside. And they found that that alone had substantially reduced the, uh, the, the morbidity of uh, TB in that little clinic in Limpopo province. So you know, I think that there is an effort to try to understand uh, at least how in addressing AIDS treatment we're not exacerbating risk for, for TB and maybe more of, uh, proactively how it is that we can use that opportunity to get people who have come in for HIV to, to address TB. Um, I do want to ask you some more about that, but I want to come back to, there were some more questions over here um, in the back and then over in the left and then Sharon. Hi, Jason Meisner with Relief International. Um, I wanted to touch more on the HIV. Um, you have countries, let's say like Burma, where you, there's a high TB rate but also high HIV rate, um, particularly one of the highest in Asia. And you also have a population living with both. I was wondering if you know of any innovative, innovative approaches, um, particularly for integrating both and the role humanitarian organizations can play with national health centers. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the numbers would suggest that the two programs are increasingly playing well together. That the numbers of TB patients who are being screened for HIV and HIV 
for TB are, are, are going up. And, and I'm not actually familiar myself with, with which of those are really working well and which are not, uh, and That's what the what common ask. themes are that are, that are, uh, that are emerging out of that. I, I do know that you know, the, the, the blueprint for an AIDS-free generation is, I think, a, a really landmark document in terms of the way it, 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 it addresses TB, HIV uh, together. Uh, and brings together funding streams in an important way. But I think it does, you know, the issue in, in Myanmar is a population that has higher rates of TB, higher rates of HIV. <coughs> they also have malaria and, and where artemisinin-resistant malaria has been found. So I think there is an understanding of how basic health uh, system capacity is an issue rather than sort of addressing one of the diseases uh, and also addressing uh, a migrant population uh, or workers that are moving in and out of one area to do lumber or mineral uh, extraction or other things. So uh, Steve Morrison and I and uh, Tom Collison and others are actually going to Myanmar in a couple of weeks and we're going to write a little CSIS report. So hopefully we'll have something pretty to show you that gives you maybe a more definitive answer to the question you just asked. Over here. Hi, Kate Doyle from PATH. You've talked previously about what you think the role of communities is very important, as well as how much you think new tools can be a game changer. But can you comment on how, prior to implementation, you think communities can have an input in working with drug developers, with PDPs, on things like target product profiles and user acceptability? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I can say that it seems intuitively obvious they should be at the table and they should be involved. I, I can say that I'm seeing more and more of that happening, that, that you know, uh, affected communities are increasingly involved in those discussions. Um, I, I think what, uh, what, what we're also seeing is, is, is sort of formally treating those communities as um, recipients and thus sort of finding preferences, uh, you know, actually going out and doing the research as you would if they were, you know, rich Southern California housewives or something. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of little things I've seen, but, but I, 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 it's actually not something I, I've had a lot of personal experience with. I do recall an incident, though, where uh, <coughs> I think you were actually with her, where Melinda Gates was in Hainan province in southern China. and went to a TB clinic and saw someone, a woman who was being treated with dots. And in that case, it was uh, 32 tablets uh, per treatment and came back uh, quite ready to push the foundation to, uh, to do a better job about understanding uh, what it was like for her to have to go to a clinic every day and take 32 different pills and how could that possibly happen. So maybe a little bit more awareness among some of the donors at understanding what actual people need and are willing to take and how they take them uh, has got to enter into the discussion here, particularly when we're not going to have short, very short treatments or a vaccine. Yeah, no, that actually, I remember that clearly because I, I thought I was showing her a really successful clinic. You know, they had lots of people there and they were taking their drugs and she perceived it entirely differently and actually much more accurately, which was like, wow, that's an impressive pill burden. And why do they have such a long line they have to wait in every day? Uh, Sharon. Hi. Hi. I think this is on. Peter, thank you for being here today. Um, one question, um, bubbling up in the literature more and more these days are discussions of TB and uh, diabetes. And, you know, coming in from India, where obviously you have very large <coughs> epidemics of both occurring. I wonder if you could comment on the importance of looking at that interaction. And then, you know, sort of posing the related question, we all know how difficult it's been to deal with TB and HIV integration. Um, and you know what what does that teach us or tell us as we, we think more broadly about diabetes and TB and some of the other things that we've been talking about here? Yeah, I think that the, the, not just uh, diabetes, but a spectrum of uh, non-communicable diseases, which is is starting to get some a lot more traction and a lot more formal attention, and and it, it it's going to bring up the same issues of of how do these you know communities and 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 service networks actually integrate and. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether we can expect them to accelerate their uh, progress by learning from HIV or whether it's incumbent upon all communities to just relearn the same stuff. And, and, and you know, so that's going to be probably the biggest challenge is, is, is ensuring that there's cross-learning and not re relearning. 
So um, it's uh, 1.30. Um, we will uh, let our last question come uh, from here, and then uh, we'll conclude. I'll let you know what's coming forward to you from CSIS, a working group that Sharon is actually chairing. I have the microphone. Oh, Can Tom. I ask a question? Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe two questions? Can um, you tell us who you are? Yeah, Tom Kenyon, CDC. Uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing your incredibly rich experience and all the foundations done for TB and other, other causes. I wonder if you could come back to diagnostics and um, talk about TB diagnostics in the context of broader in infectious disease diagnostics and, and having a point of care technology that would address a battery of infectious diseases at the same time. Because I think it, it in spite of the technology, it remains elusive, uh, and it requires not only health-seeking behavior on the part of the patient, but as you showed amongst yourselves, uh, diagnostic-seeking behavior on the part of the clinician, and, and can't we take the thinking out of it and make it uh, more automated? So for example, in a given community, you knew uh, the top five etiologies of uh, lung disease or or fatal infectious diseases and can include those in a package of technologies and, and use GeneXpert as the approach. Is that feasible and how far away are we from that? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you know, I, it, it, the diagnostics industry is a platform industry. And so right now, you know, GeneXpert, for example, has a TB uh, cartridge and other cartridges as well. They're not tuned for the needs of the local environment. And so having a, a, a fever cartridge, uh, diarrhea cartridge, and, and all the rest is a big push in a number of, of diagnostics initiatives. Um, I, but it, you know, it also gets to the, to the systems issue of um, we, I kind of grew up in the TB community and, and, and we always, I always thought it was great. You know, it's like, wow, with this we can prove they don't have TB and send them on their way. And you know, it, it's, it's actually really ungratifying for the patient. <laughs> and uh, and, and so, so I think that there's not only, you know, it doesn't only make sense for the, for the system to be able to say, oh, you know, this wasn't TB, it was something else. It's, it's actually gonna really drive consumer behavior. Uh, because what we, what I used to consider big win is like, oh, we sent him from the TV clinic, turns out it's an MTB, you know, is, 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 he goes home and goes like, I went to that place, you know, I waited all day, they took my sputum, and they did nothing for me. The good news is I don't have TB, the bad news is I'm still dead. Yeah, <laughs> which was true of my cough, incidentally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last question. Hi, uh, Alam Sabri, the intern Todd mentioned earlier. Um, two things I remember from my medical training back in Morocco. Uh, first, treatment, treatment and diagnosis were definitely challenging, but also factors highly associated with tuberculosis, tuberculosis like malnutrition. Uh, are these factors uh, taken into consideration when tackling tuberculosis globally? Yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I think that the traditional approach to TB was to set up a clinic and wait for people to come in and, and diagnose them and treat them. I, I think as we start to move towards a modern DOTS, it's going to be targeted outreach and, and intervention. And so, uh, you know, malnourished diabetic populations obviously would have be a sort of target rich in a way. and. Um, uh, but I, I, there's so many of these things are collinear, right? It's, it's the people who have diabetes or the people who have malnutrition, you know, are poor and they live in a crowded area. So, so in a sense, you kind of wrap them up by, by focusing on them kind of synthetically and not to say like, oh, let's go find the malnourished people and screen them. But maybe there should be more of that. Yeah, we had a number of questions here around sort of these cross connections. Yeah. A lot of discussion around understanding what patients need and want and how to ensure that they have the capacity to seek care. Uh, you know, certainly focus on the delivery side of things, which is quite interesting. So I want to conclude and, uh, and, and uh, one by asking you, if you don't mind, uh, fill out that little form on your chair. Um, uh, and you can just leave it back on your chair. It gives us a little bit of feedback as to whether or not this was a useful session for you. 
Uh, we're also happy to take uh, comments uh, uh, in other ways, but this does it a little more systematically. Uh, if you can join me in thanking Peter for, for participating today, and wish you all a happy Fourth of July week. Thank you.